Friends, this is a channel uniquely Mary, and I'm Alvaro. And today we have a very special guest with us that has written a fiction book on purgatory based on another book on purgatory that is quite amazing, amazing that I want to get into in this month. Uh, we're going to get into it right away. If you want to support this channel in any way, please do so through Buy Me a Coffee. Also, later on in the video, we'll talk about how and where you can uh, purchase these books. So we'll go ahead and begin. So um, so I'll, I'll, a lot of it, I'll let you speak and introduce yourself. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and a little bit about your background. Okay. My name is Teresa Linden, and I'm a cradle Catholic. I've been married for 32 years, and we have three boys. They're all grown now. And we're also secular Franciscans. And when I look back, there are three events in my life that kind of led to me becoming a Catholic fiction author. And the first one is um, I was raised in a military family. So we were always moving every couple of years. We lived in California. Then we lived in Guam, which is just this tiny island in the Pacific. And then we moved to Oahu. And all of those different experiences kind of left me with the impression that life is an adventure. And then uh, another factor was my sister and I, when we were in grade school, we um, we wrote stories to each other just for fun. We would take turns writing chapters of this ongoing story where we would leave our characters in a cliffhanger and then the other one had to write them out of the cliffhanger. So it was a lot of fun and it really developed my imagination. And then the third point is when I was in the seventh grade, my dad retired here in Ohio, and I kind of felt like the adventure of life had ended. Like It was just so cold here, and it was so hard to make friends. It was totally different in the military because everybody's new on the bases, you know, so you're easy to make friends with. Mm -hmm. But here it was different, and it wasn't until uh, high school I joined the Catholic youth group, and the youth leader was just so on fire for the faith, and she would talk about things like... Um, Eucharistic miracles, the Blessed Mother's apparitions, saints who had the stigmata. You know, I'd never heard of any of these things before, and it was just so exciting. She just kind of took the catechism that I grew up with and just, like, opened it up or brought it to life, put the spirit in it, you know. There's so much more going on in our lives than just the physical things that that we can see. There's the whole spiritual side of life, and it it sort of reignited that um, feeling that life was an adventure, only this time it was comprised of both physical and spiritual. So then when I was, go ahead. That, that's interesting. It, it's almost like you had this kind of physical adventure with these amazingly tropical yeah. and remote places. And then you went to to where you were maybe living now, maybe not as exciting, but still beautiful. And then you kind mm -hmm. of get so to speak, like the tropical, um, like the, the exciting parts of the faith. Those are the parts of the faith that, that I love, that the saints yeah. and the miracles and the mystical things. I think those are really, those are kind of the hidden treasures that, that a lot of times we don't talk about. They are. They're so amazing. And you think about why God does those things. He just loves us so much. And once he'll do anything to, you know, convince us that he's real and that this is the one true church and, you know, that he wants us for himself. So it was just very, very moving. And I needed it at that time. And it kind of took away the loneliness. But then when I was an adult, um, I really thought I wanted to combine those three loves, my my love for the faith, my love for adventure, my love for writing. And so it just kind of fit that I could become a Catholic fiction writer. Awesome. What was your first book that you wrote? So the first book that I wrote was actually uh, Roland West Loner. It's not the first one that was published, but it was the first one that I wrote. And it's the first in a uh, contemporary Catholic teen fiction series, which is it brings uh, the Catholic faith to the issues that teens face. Mm -hmm. And while I was writing this first book, though, by then I had three children and I loved doing it. But you spend so much time when you're writing. So I was just really praying. And I remember one day in particular, getting down on my knees before this beautiful crucifix that we have in our house that came from Mexico with the, you know, what crown that you can't touch it because it's like got spikes and, yeah. you know, it doesn't hide the agony that Jesus went through. And I was on my knees just 
begging Jesus to let me know. I wasn't one to pray for signs, but in this case, I felt like I needed one because I didn't want to spend so much time doing something if it was just for me. You know, I wanted to know it was his will. And then it was amazing because in the next few days, uh, three signs came, came my way. A yeah. friend of mine called me from out of the blue, like we hadn't spoken to each other in years. And she told me about her daughter who just graduated from college with an English degree and she wanted uh, to be an editor. So she offered to edit my books for free. Wow. So that was, yeah, that's an expense that I didn't have to worry about. And uh -huh. then one of my favorite authors, I don't know if you're familiar with Susan Peek. She writes um, Saint Stories for Teens. No, 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 I haven't heard of her. Well, she was my favorite, one of my favorite authors, because just the way that she, you know, develops her stories, is they're so fun to read. And here she was also a member of the Catholic Writers Guild, and she reached out to me to, like, exchange manuscripts and do critiquing and beta reading and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was exciting. And then the third thing was, there's a particular saint in this story that, you know, comes into play. And I, when I was trying to pick the saint, I had three qualifications. I wanted him to be German, Franciscan, and little known. So I picked this saint. And um, who'd you pick? Who was it? You want to? You want me to tell you? <laughs> is it? Is it supposed to be a surprise? It kind of is in the story. Yeah. Okay. Then it's then, then the we'll just save it for the book. Okay. But. Um, I didn't really research much about the saint because I just needed those three uh, characteristics. But uh -huh. then at the time after that prayer, I was getting to know the saint a little better and he fits so perfectly with my main character. So the story is called Roland West Loner and he, you know, Roland is very lonely. Well, he lost his mother at an early age and so did the saint. He was kind of picked on by his brothers. And so was the saint only by the, the brother Franciscans. Yeah. And there were other similarities too, but it was just an amazing time. Like God answered my prayer. I could feel with each of those things, I could feel his grace and almost hear him saying, you know, this is your answer. I want you to do this. So that was the first book. That's amazing. You know, I was thinking just about how one of the awesome things of our Catholic faith is it allows these things like art and literature um, it just gives them a, a different element and, and it uh, you could bring them into the faith and use them as a way of of life, a way to live, a way to kind of uh, to share that with the world, but also sustain yourself. And as, and especially me, me doing this on YouTube, it, it's amazing to have that, that it's not just something mm -hmm. that you do in a corner in a building and then it you can't bring it into the rest of your life. You could literally um, dedicate the rest of your life to it and, and, and Catholics have done it since Augustine and even before him. Yeah. And it's it's it awesome that we have that. Poetry and all of that. Yeah. So then uh, tell me a little bit about how your, your writing kind of developed. And then eventually you got onto the the, the topic of, of purgatory, maybe a, a little bit the background of, of what your, um, how did that devotion to them begin in your life? Mm -hmm. Um how did, how did it develop? Tell us a little bit about that. So I, I think my devotion developed with this book. <laughs> I read this when I was a young woman. Like I would just read, you know, a few pages every night. And sometimes I was kind of wishing I wasn't reading it before bed because then all of the, the shadows in the room come alive. But this is Purgatory by, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Father Shupe. Yeah. It's a, published by Tan. But so I, I just read through this and it, was a lot of eye openers for me and some startling encounters that saints had with the souls. But I really learned about the teaching of purgatory and, you know, how it's the mercy of God and how much God just loves these souls and wants them to be with him forever in heaven. And the souls love him. And that's mm -hmm. what the, the burning is, is they're, you know, just longing to be with God. And uh, I read somewhere that, the pain that they experience is more intense than anything we could imagine in this world, but also the joy that they experience is more than we could ever imagine, you know, so they wouldn't trade positions with us for, for anything, you know, yeah. but just reading that, I, I really came to think about more about the souls and then to know that they can't pray for themselves. They can't do anything. And that's left up to us. You know, it's such an honor, really, that God allows us to help out in this way with our 
our brothers and sisters who have gone before us. So that's that's kind of what started my my devotion. And I've always wanted to write a purgatory story because I just feel like um, a lot of people don't really they don't they don't know they don't think to pray. Uh, I was giving a purgatory talk at one time. And I made a little pie chart that shows how many people are in the world and how many of them are Catholic. And it's like, you know, 16%. So there's a little piece of the pie. Uh But then out of the Catholics, the ones that practice their faith, which I think it was Pew Research counted, if you went to Sunday Mass, you practice your faith. So that was like a third of that group. So you're down to like 6%. And then the number of Catholics that really believe all of the teachings of the church is just this tiny sliver of the pie piece of you know, the population of the world. So every day, so many souls are passing away, you know, and who's praying for them. So, you know, I've always just wanted to write a book that would draw attention to the holy souls. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, um, thinking about that book and connecting, that book, I think, is like this particularly amazing example, how he put it together. Like sometimes when I was reading through that, I thought I would have loved to have followed this priest around just to see where did he find these stories? Because you you almost get the sense like he's just scouring all over Europe to kind of find fragments of this right. story here and 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 just compiling that and 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 it being and difficult to even appreciate. <laughs> huh? They didn't have the internet, so they didn't have any easy searches. Yeah. And I was sort of thinking, I wonder how you see a book like that as an author, just the amount of work that mm-hmm. it would have taken. Um, something that's a little bit similar is you may know, you know, this, this church dedicated the, to the souls in purgatory in Rome yeah. mm-hmm. where a priest sort of did a similar thing, but he went around Rome to collect kind of physical artifacts of, of signs that the souls in purgatory had left and to tell their story. And just that that's, that's not easy to do, you know, and it's, but it's, mm-hmm. but obviously God wants to share that. And, uh, you know, and then in my own channel, a lot of the videos that people really like are the purgatory stories. Something that's that's huge in YouTube is just the understanding of, of if you could get a storyline in there, it doesn't matter what it is, but stories hook people, whether it's secular topics or anything. Like you always want like uh, to develop in, in this way so that people want to find out what happens at the end. You know, even the, mm-hmm. the biggest YouTubers are in some sense storytellers. Yeah. And and then as I, as I was kind of developing the channel, I really, I was just like, wow, this is, I'm getting, cause I'm, I'm not naturally, you know, someone that's able to tell a story very well, but, but I was able to kind of get the opportunity to grow that and learn that. So it's awesome. So, so you and your work is completely suited to, um, to, to think- sharing this truth with people. Stories reach people in a different way too than um, nonfiction and devotionals because you're kind of identifying with the character more and you're experiencing whatever they experience and you can develop empathy, which, you know, is what as a writer you, you, or particularly for this story, I want people to develop empathy, not just for the main character, but for the soul that is in my story. And then also for all of the souls as a result. They have fiction, really, Jesus used parables all the time. So there's there's a reason for that, the way it speaks to to our minds. When I was, when I found you, I, I read a part where you were talking about how that you were working on something and then the uh, the inspiration for, for, for the book that you wrote on purgatory kind of came about. Tell us a little bit yeah. about how, kind of how, how that was birthed, was what was going on in your life at the time. Yeah, I was in the middle of um, one of the West Brothers manuscripts, and I just, I don't know if I had um, read Eugenie's story and, you know, the parts that I found of her diary, if I had read it well in advance or if I had just read it, but it was just so compelling and I could just see it, you know, coming to life as a story. And so I just knew I had to set everything aside and switch gears because I just couldn't stop thinking about that story. Mm -hmm. And it came together rather rather quickly. The the first thing that I do when I'm writing is a ton of research. So I got to dive into more things. And then I relearn about purgatory and relearn about the mercy of God, anything that's going to be in that story. And then after all that research, I, I'm a note card person. So I make yeah. my little, my plot points and character development and my outline and, and all of that. 
And it's just like you, you carry this story around with you for the entire time that you're working on it. So you're thinking about it in the shower, you're dreaming about it at night. You know, and sometimes I'd wake up and I'd have a scene, you know, come to life in my mind and I'd have to hurry up. It could be even the middle of the night, yeah. <laughs> which is good because then I'd be disturbing my husband as I turn on the light and I have to get that scene down. But it's very exciting. I feel like it's such a gift and you know, when I'm writing and in the brainstorming process, I'm always stopping to thank God because it's such a joyful gift and experience to be able to, you know, have those ideas and then to to put them on paper and, you know, kind of bring this story to life. That's really amazing that there's a movie, I think, that kind of showcases a little bit of what that process is like. I think it's called uh, The Man Who Invented Christmas. And it talks about Charles Dickens and and it shows him kind of going in his daily life. Oh. Yeah. seeing the characters come to life and that's that's sort of what comes to mind with you describing that that you're maybe thinking about the next chapter or the next scene of the book like mm -hmm. almost like a movie but ju but just kind of in written form um so see, since you've done more research and know more than than i about uh princess eugenia tell us who she is give us kind of the a, a nutshell how did you find out about her um what have you found about her that that's maybe particularly interesting uh, there's a lot of online research, but there's also some about her in this other book that I have. Sorry, it's called Hungry Souls. I don't know if you've read that one. Yes, yeah. But that's a good one, too. But a, a lot of just um, online research. And Eugenie von der Leyen is considered a modern-day mystic, largely because she's from she lived from 1867 to 1929 in Germany. Although I've set my story in contemporary times in upstate New York, just to have it something, you know, that could be more relatable to readers. And uh, Eugenie was of high German nobility, and she had the title of princess. Both of her parents were actually from German princely families. Her father was the third Prince von der Leyen, and then her mother is from a, a different princely family. For most of her life, she lived in a castle in Wall, Bavaria in Germany. And you can go on YouTube or um, Google Maps and you can, you know, look it up. You can actually zoom in real close and see the grounds and the castle and everything. So that was part of my search. It was just fun to see that, even though I didn't really use that type of a house at all yeah. for my story. But I, I've read about lots of mystics who've had encounters with the souls and and saw visions of purgatory, but she just seemed to fit so well. Um, there's two reasons that I chose her. One was, even though she was a princess and she was well-educated, she was also very down to earth and it just, everybody loved her. She was so, so charitable and self-sacrificing, you know, for other people. I got the impression, the more I read about her, that she just knew everybody in town, including, you know, the shepherds. <laughs> yeah. Just, Maybe maybe but, that's oh, the reason why she had that gift with the souls in purgatory, like her kind of natural sociability, generosity, yeah, yeah, generosity, and like almost like she was a people person, literally in the natural and supernatural sense. Yes, I think that's why. And um, I kind of liked that she's not declared a saint because I really want to convey the message that praying for the souls in purgatory is not just the work of the saints, but it's that something that we're all called to do. So that was like the first reason. And then the, the second reason was um, her confessor. Hold on a second. I need to find my page. No worries. Okay. Oh, here it is. So Eugenie's confessor, once she told him about the apparitions, he, ordered her to keep a diary. And so that's just so much wonderful material if you're writing a story <laughs> about her because she documents everything in order. She shows, you know, what these souls look like when she first sees them and then how they changed as a result of her prayer, which was just so incredible. And she talked about what they, what they said, what they did and how they made her feel, which is also something, you know, you really want to have for your story. And a lot of the times they terrified her in her own words. She said they, you know, it was a terrifying experience, but yet she just kept praying for them and, you know, sacrificing and, and being generous, you know, but um, 
While several souls appear to this mystic, there's only one soul in my story. I've kind of combined two of the souls mm -hmm. that were, you know, actual souls from the diary. And I tried to really stick to being faithful to how she conveyed these appearances because I wanted that to be as authentic as possible. But one of the souls that appeared that that my soul is based off is a shepherd named Fritz. And I named my soul Fred. He's a mechanic <laughs> because yeah. there's not a lot of not, shepherd isn't a common occupation nowadays. But the story opens with a glimpse of who Fred is before he dies. And he's just an ordinary man. You know, he's hardworking. He has his things that he likes and doesn't like. And, you know, he he's listening to his Louis Armstrong music on his new sound system while he's working on somebody's car in his his business, his garage. And he has no idea that he's this his last day on Earth. You know, it's the same for all of us. Nobody knows the day or the hour. It's something that everyone should be thinking about, you know. But the man then, Fred, dies in the same way that the shepherd Fritz died, which was he was murdered at the hands of his son, which mm. is, you know, very tragic. And there's obviously a lot of history between the father and son that, you know, he could do something like that. But when this soul first appeared to Eugenie, um, she described him as this gray nebulous form. So he didn't even really look like a person. He was just this, you know, frightening form. And it wasn't until she started praying for him that he looked more human. And then she could tell it was a man. And then she could um, identify who he was. And she she knew him, you know. So even though she's this princess, she knew this shepherd. So it just shows you, you know, the kind of, of person that she was too. By the way, the... Uh... The book that she's referring to, it's it's called uh, My Conversation with Poor Souls. That this is the if you get it in print form, and and Teresa was telling me just before we began recording that that it was just published recently, even though it was written, or I think maybe it was translated into English recently. I've only begun reading it, and and some of the ways that you, that she describes uh, uh, Princess Eugenie in in the book, her initial encounters. It's it's really you could almost say disturbing, like it, yeah, it's, it's right. It's frightening, and I would imagine that you know one thing that we can learn is that um, that because maybe people like imagine that the soul in purgatory, like it's very clear when it appears to you, it and that it looks very human, you, you know, like that they look very human, you know, that it's that it's an obvious thing, but but that sometimes it can happen to where you don't know what this is, right? And, yeah. and so it takes some discernment. And that's part of that spiritual world that that we don't fully understand everything. Mm -hmm. You know, so you could you can learn a lot from her experiences. Yeah, she just really had to be a brave person <laughs> to face all that. Lots of courage, yeah. and a very merciful person. Um, the second soul that I use actually had a dark connection with Eugenie von der Leyen, which I won't share because it'll kind of spoil something in the book, but you'll get sure. to them as you're reading through that. But so I, I had a similar connection in my story with the main character and the soul, and I let it unfold gradually through memories and through their conversation. And also through their conversation, that's where a lot of the teachings of purgatory, you know, come out uh -huh. uh, through that. Tell us before we, because sometimes I'll do this, tell us the name of the book, of your the book that you wrote. Oh, okay. It's called Tortured Soul. And you could get it. Uh, I, I almost always get most of my books on Kindle when you're able to. You can get on on Amazon as well as other place. If you look it up, you can you can find it. But I'll I'll put a picture up here of, okay. uh, of the book. You know, I found that when uh, whenever I do different videos on purgatory, especially if there's some that are meaningful, that it could be it could be stressful. I'll, I'll sometimes experience, I'll, I'll think of it as like, it just feels like a lot of spiritual warfare or just these things that happen. Um, what was that like in writing the book? Were there any interesting things that happened in you and your family or, or kind of like a ways in which maybe God was purifying you as you were writing the book? I don't remember any specific incidences like that, but that is always the case. Whenever you're trying to do something for God, there's always, you know, a little more strife that you have to kind of just offer up and know, you know, if God is calling you to it, that he's going to give you the grace to do it. But, you know, it was a very prayerful time. And I feel like I, 
I came out of it even closer to the the holy souls because just so intimately connected for that period of time of writing the book and then just you know really happy to get the the book to people i had um one reader emailed me um he said i could share his story but of course i won't use his name but his um mother had treated him horribly as a child and then when she was when they were older and she was dying um he wanted to forgive her so you know he went out of his way to tell her you know he forgave her and he was sorry for you know anything that he did and then after she died she she left him out of her will and so then all of the the anger came back and he said that he had been unable to forgive her and you know never prayed for her and then after he read the book and you know the encounter with this particular soul he said he just gained the grace to forgive her and pray for her and offer masses for her and i just thought that was so beautiful that's amazing yeah i've definitely seen that as well that that, that people will come out and and talk about their own experiences or um, mm-hmm. either with deceased loved ones that, that they need to forgive or heal or or their own kind of purgatory stories uh in fact, recently I, I took one of them that they had shared a while back and I had just forgotten about it. And I turned it into a video because it, it was just so beautiful when you when you uh read through that. So that the the woman with their Protestant husband? Yeah. That was, yeah, so that, that was, was they had left an amazing story that that sometimes there's just a, a number of comments where it's hard to kind of remember to to stick with it. So that's maybe something you've experienced that kind of privilege if you put this out there and then people come out and begin sharing mm-hmm. their stories and and you have the privilege of, of of being a witness to that yeah what was that like one thing i i liked very much is at the beginning of the book you dedicated to the souls in purgatory and then uh, i thought it was awesome that you were able to get susan to zone to um to kind of write something in the foreword how did you, how oh. did that happen yeah, well, after I finished writing it, I was um, just asking around with the Catholic Writers Guild, all the other writers, to see like who I could get to uh, endorse the book. And so everybody suggested her because she's kind of like the purgatory lady. Um, I don't know if you know, she just came out with a purgatory book for kids, too. Mm-mm. Yeah, I've got a, I have a proof copy of it. It's this, New Friends Now and Forever. It's just for children. So it. It brings the the teachings of purgatory to children so that they can, you know, learn about it and start to pray. But that's, that's I, great. Never, I think someone someone had mentioned that, but that would obviously be an amazing thing to uh, for those of you that have children to share that with them to to get them started early. So that way, it's not this scary yeah, kind of distant right. idea. But it's it's really like I like I I love how she says they're your friends. Um, yes. There, there, there's a few different images that like I've kind of had in my mind uh, a sense of them being your friends or sometimes I use this one where they're kind of like your personal army mm-hmm. um, and, and there's so much truth to to all of that it, it everyone could use especially now where people are often very lonely they could use more bodyguards and more friends right exactly yeah it's it's a lovely story here's her endorsement for my book it's, she said Teresa's Lin- Teresa Linden's tortured soul gives an accurate, captivating, and novel way for readers to learn about and better understand the church's teaching on purgatory. So I was really happy about that because that's what I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to entertain and I wanted to bring in, you know, all the true teachings on purgatory to inspire people, you know, yeah. to pray for them. I think it's awesome, you know, when you look at some of the work that other people have done there's always new ways to bring about the gospel that, yes. that, I, that I always think that that if the church doesn't claim it someone else will and they'll take it away mm-hmm. and, and for instance we shouldn't be afraid of using fiction even sometimes people maybe think oh well it's not true and well a lot of Jesus's parables like were, were fiction right with, with the truth that maybe was deeper than an actual real event might have been able to taught you yeah i think stories can be very powerful in in conveying catholic truth because you can start to see yourself maybe and the characters and and see the different situations that they face and you know you think about what would i do and what is the right thing to do and yeah you could just 
learn so much, even from a fictional story that's not preachy, but you're just yeah. going through the situation. Yeah, I think that that's a huge point that, and probably a lot of us realize that um, that there's only certain people that you can come out with the the kind of the upfront truth. You know, a lot of times people would use the expression that you're preaching to the choir, but to those people that mm-hmm. that they're not open, you can't just sometimes come out and say, "Hey, you need right. to just." the church is a true church and accept Jesus and all that. It, it just doesn't work. There has to be other ways. And this is, I think a way of you're telling a story and you're, but you're conveying a message with it. Like, like a lot of movies do that. They, mm-hmm. They're not coming out with certain messages, but, but you can, you can see them and, and hear them if, if you're paying attention. Good messages or bad. And a lot yeah. of the movies out there today. Yeah. Even a Protestant, um, read tortured soul and did a review on it and she was really touched by it and she said it made her think about you know things that she hadn't really thought about before so she wasn't really opposed to the idea of you know that there's this purification after we die she i think it made her think one thing that's been interesting for me i was thinking about it just before um we were meeting is is and, and and i've been wanting to do a video about it but there's several hollywood movies some really recent and some older that they all go with this idea of people who die that they're not in hell but they have unfinished business and and there's very much that idea that they have to do something and they need help i mean the movie the sixth sense is all about that right um yeah there's a, there's a few other movies that 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 the idea of completing things that you left undone is extremely profound and i think even secular people get that they they can understand that you can die and mm-hmm. there's something that you still have to do. And it's for, logical. It just makes sense, you know, yeah. and really everything about the Catholic faith makes sense and falls into place. I remember when, um, when I was young and somebody would come to the door, like the Mormons or the Jehovah witness or Baptist, my mom would always talk to them. <laughs> she would, you know, be out on the porch or through the screen or even invite them in. But she would listen to them and ask them questions. And it seems like mom had an answer for everything about the Catholic faith. And her her answers were logical and they made sense. And I didn't know my faith. I mean, I was just a child. I didn't know my faith like she knew her faith. And even, you know, when I was an adult and then people questioned me about my faith, I kind of remembered mom. And so I, I knew the Catholic church was the one true church and there would always be an answer. I didn't have those answers. Mm-hmm. So I was always saying, okay, I'll get back to you. <laughs> but then I started to learn my faith too. But, you know, it's logical and it makes sense. And purgatory completely makes sense, you know, with with justice and mercy too. Mm-hmm. So Teresa, do you have a, do you have any uh, future works in the, in the works? Any, any future books? Uh, have you thought about what your future looks like in that sense, whether it's uh, other other Catholic fiction books directed towards teenagers or other or kind of going more in depth with with uh, some other purgatory stories? What are some things that, that maybe you could share? I do us? have a, a young adult purgatory story. It's it's a manuscript that I kind of set aside. Some things weren't working out with it. and It's been years, but I do need to get back to that. <clears throat> And most of the books that I write are geared towards teens, but I recently started writing a children's Armor of God series, their chapter Mm -hmm. book, where the, you know, boys and girls attend night school, (laughs) you know, K and I, (laughs) night school, and they earn each piece of armor. So, you know, they're practicing the virtues, you know, the belt of truth and the boots of peace and breastplate of righteousness. So I have that and the, there's a, an illustrator that's working on the last book. So I'll be able to get the entire series out. And then I'm also working on, I've been really compelled to write a children's chapter book series about the rosary. And so there's a lot of uh, nonfiction out there that tell you about the rosary mysteries and they're very beautiful, very well done. But this is again, fiction. Mm -hmm. So my characters will sort of step through this portal to the rosary mysteries and they'll experience them. So they'll go back into Bible times and they'll get to see the Annunciation and they have to try to figure out the mystery, the virtue that is attached to each mystery, and then they can move on to the next one. So it's, it's a lot of fun writing these things and then I have to get them illustrated and, you know, that sounds, that sounds great. That's really awesome that, that, uh, 
that God is work, using you as an instrument in doing these things that the, and there's uh, more to come in the future. If people, I don't know if you do ha have a website or if people want to reach out or when people ask, Hey, where can I get you books, your books? What's the uh, best way to do that? Is there through the publisher or through Amazon? What do you recommend? So they can go to my website, which is just my name, Teresa with a H, Teresa Linden .com. Okay. And they're also on my, I publish under a silver fire publishing imprint. So the books are available through there too, or anywhere you buy books online, you know, sure. Amazon, and, um, what is that? Um, other bookseller I can think of, but Barnes and Noble, <laughs> just, you know, what would be nice though, is for people to go to their Catholic bookstores and order them through there. Even if they don't carry my books, they can order them and then you get to support the local Catholic bookstores. Yeah, that would be great. That That's a really great suggestion. I'll, I'll put some of those uh, kind of website links and, and things either, either in the description or kind of embedded in the video. Thank you. So great. So how about, um, I, I really appreciate you taking time today to, for this interview, to share a little bit about yourself and, and your work. How about we uh, finish with a prayer and trusting all of what we're doing to the Blessed Mother? Okay. All right. And thanks for having me on your show. I feel really, really appreciative. That, You're you welcome. Know, it, it, it's a real blessing. So let's, let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, mm -hmm. the Lord is with thee. Mm -hmm. Blessed art blessed thou amongst women, mm -hmm. and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Mm -hmm. Holy Mary, Mother of God, mm -hmm. pray for us sinners, mm -hmm. now, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you to all of you that have joined us today. Again, please check out Teresa's website, and as well, support this channel in any way that, that you can through Buy Me a Coffee and through your prayers. I will see you in the next one.